Okay, this is Rudolf Virchow, um, who proposed uh, the triad that we use to try to understand the pathophysiology of all thromboses, arterial and venous thromboses, a deep venous thrombosis, uh, including um, uh, uh, those involving the, the leg veins um, and those involving the, the pelvic and abdominal veins. Virchow also, of course, interdigitates uh, hematological malignancies uh, with thrombosis, as he was one of the first descri des describers of the syndrome that we now call acute myelogenous leukemia. Virchow proposed that thrombosis is a perturbation in the interaction between the blood, um, uh, the, the various fluid elements. Uh, they may be soluble, they may be cellular, blood vessel, uh, including the subendothelial components, and blood flow, not just simply the, the anatomy of the compartment, uh, but the, the various rheological forces uh, that are impinged on the things within the blood stream. We're going to try to consider splanctic vein thrombosis from this perspective because, frankly, there aren't many data uh, otherwise available to help us understand it. The scope of the problem is something that we're familiar with. Um, uh, it's most commonly associated with polycythemia vera, but also essential thrombocytosis uh, and primary myelofibrosis. Uh, you can see that a significant number of the splanctic vein thromboses occur prior to the diagnosis. So splanctic, undiagnosed um, idiopathic splanctic vein thrombosis often can foreshadow the presence of a previously unrecognized myeloproliferative neoplasm. And then in a select group uh, among centers that deal with this, you can see that if patients who otherwise have idiopathic um, uh, uh, splanctic vein thrombosis diagnosed, in other words, those thromboses that are obviously due to structural abnormalities in the region, uh, that, that, that almost 40% of them will have an underlying myeloproliferative neoplasm identified, with the majority being polycythemia vera. In a less selected group, and this gives you the differential diagnosis, uh, you'll see that, that the majority uh, of, of those recognized are from uh, hepatic cirrhosis with a variety of other structural problems uh, involving the abdomen that oftentimes lead to it. Notice in this group that there is, there is a very large segment of so-called idiopathic, idiopathic. So in many ways, it becomes easy to identify it when we have a, 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 an obvious mutation that's associated with myeloproliferative neoplasm. A little bit more complicated when we have so-called idiopathic, meaning that all possibly recognizable predispositions or triggers uh, have been ruled out. So let's talk about diagnosis and therapy. Uh, this is Donald Rumsfeld. We're not too far from the Defense Department. Rumsfeld had his own triad. He talked about those knowns that are knowns. He talked about those knowns that are unknown. And he talked about those unknowns that are unknown. I'm going to add one to it since we have clinical guidelines which oftentimes satisfy this criterion, unknown knowns. In other words, things that we think we know but we actually don't. I'm going to rearrange them and go in this order. No knowns. Well, these are pretty well worked out because they're clinical descriptions that have been uh, available for well over half a century. Hepatic vein thrombosis, also known as Bud Chiari syndrome, a uh, significant percentage of them are, are asymptomatic. They're rarely fulminant. Uh, oftentimes, they present acutely with painful hepatomegaly, ascites, and splenomegaly. The, the, the liver function studies are not too bad. It isn't usually a whopping transaminitis. Uh, patients with chronic uh, Bud Chiari syndrome will develop cirrhosis and portal hypertension. Portal vein thrombosis, sometimes asymptomatic. We actually don't know, and ironically, despite the fact that Bud Chiari has the, the far more formidable reputation, it may be that more patients present asymptomatically with that than with the other syndromes. Um, acute with fever and other nonspecific abdominal symptoms, including nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Chronic with portal hypertension. And then mesenteric vein thrombosis, asymptomatic to catastrophic, catastrophic being represented by ischemia infarction of the bowel wall, typically some amount of abdominal pain associated with diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, and lower GI bleeding. So they're very nonspecific, actually. And if you're not thinking about them, there's a good chance you won't go looking for them. How does one go look for them? Well, the diagnosis is pretty straightforward. A dual phase CT with oral contrast, greater than 90% sensitivity for all thromboses, uh, including the very small uh, mesenteric vein thrombi. Uh, and as well, it will oftentimes identify those structural abnormalities that could be predisposing to the thrombosis mm -hmm. in the first place. Uh, MRI has comparable sensitivity, but is much more expensive, perhaps 10 times more expensive. Uh, ultrasound Doppler is only good for the big veins, like the extrahepatic portal vein and the hepatic vein.
So let's talk about the known unknowns, guidelines that have been presented uh, that may or may not be evidence-based. Okay, what we have here is what do we do? What do we do about bone marrow biopsy? And, and someone in this room will be happy to know that we do, in fact, talk about red cell masses when we're totally dis <laughs> desperate. Um, but, but you can see here that this is one approach. The bottom line is that in somebody where you haven't identified an obvious predisposition or trigger, um, then it's important to do mutational testing. And I would advocate for that, but I wouldn't necessarily advocate for these guidelines. The next, of course, would be therapy. And this is really important, uh, the idea of cytoreduction, um, uh, whether it's done chemically or through phlebotomy, the idea of anticoagulation, how do we treat these patients, and then, of course, how long we treat this patient, always the most important issue when managing venous thromboembolic disease. So this is Winston Churchill, and although I present you the guidelines, who do, I do not adv advocate for them. Those of us who have been on these panels sometimes know that the squeaky wheel gets the grease, and so I will say that, that Winston Churchill perhaps summarizes my view of these guidelines, not necessarily all guidelines. The best argument against democracy is a five-minute conversation with the average voter, okay? And, and otherwise, often dogma trumps data. Now let's talk about the known unknowns, things that we might know. And, and I, I think to introduce this and maybe to give it context that will make it more comprehensible, just realize that a lot of the stuff that we do to prevent thromboses in the myeloproliferative neoplasms is aimed at arterial thrombosis, which means that we're principally targeting the platelet. We're not targeting the soluble coagulation factors. So red cell reduction, platelet reduction, leukocyte reduction, antithrombotic therapy, talk a little bit about optimal management of patients with uh, dangerous hepatic vein thrombosis, and then we'll talk about the effect of JAK inhibition, what's known about it on uh, the predisposition or the treatment of thromboses. So everything here is focusing on the blood. Everything here is focusing on the blood. That's where we're at so far, and the information basically provides shadows of opportunity rather than clear data proving that this is the right way to manage these patients. So known unknowns, red cell reduction. Well, the polycythemia virus study group, as you know, was, which, which went on for a long time, um, they came to the conclusion that phlebotomy causes thrombosis. And this was very, very controversial. Um, I like the fact that it was sort of case closed uh, uh, through a, a narrative that was pre presented by an editorial by Spivak. Uh, the data upon which this criticism is based were the consequence of a complete misunderstanding of the pathophysiology of erythrocytosis in PV, uh, and I absolutely agree with that. Uh, we have the French polysemia this study group, which was kind of a registry, uh, 80 thromboses not defined, and the majority of these thromboses are not splanchnic vein thromboses. Uh, in 285 patients over 16.3 years, that's a very small annual incidence, and the annual incidence wasn't changed uh, um, uh, 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 depending upon the cytoreducing agent that they were given. And then this may be the gold standard to date, the cytopv study. There were no splanchnic vein thromboses in any of the 365 patients who were followed. Uh, there was one VT in the minus 45 group, and there were five in the 45 to 50 group, suggesting that venous thromboembolism that does not involve the abdomen uh, um, may, in fact, uh, be a, 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 a clinical marker for risk of splanchnic vein thrombosis. Um, uh, uh, and if it is, and if it is, reducing uh, venous thromboembolism not involving the, the, the abdomen it may be a reasonable target in order to reduce the development of the first splanchnic vein thrombosis. What about platelet reduction? Well, this is the primary thrombocythemia. One study, uh, 17 out of 809 high-risk patients had venous thromboembolism over 39 months. One of these patients had hepatic vein thrombosis. There were no other splanchnic vein thromboses. But, 14 in the hydroxyurea plus the aspirin group. There were 3.7 DVTs or PEs and 0.3 splanchnic vein thromboses per year versus only three in the enegrolide plus aspirin group. And this raises an interesting question. Does enegrolide plus aspirin protect against VTE or does hydroxyurea plus aspirin um, uh, promote venous thromboembolism? What about leukocyte reduction? Well, we have even fewer um, uh, indirect data. Elevated granulocytes are a risk factor for, for thrombosis in all MPNs. In PV, increased risk of unspecified thrombosis with white counts greater than 7,000. Uh, 
In ET, there was a geometric increase as the white count increased between 10,000 and 20,000. The risk of thrombosis went from roughly, uh, the, the, the hazard ratio went from roughly 2 to 4 to 5. And in MF, there was a two-fold increased risk of VT with a white count greater than 15,000. So, of course, these raise the question, hardly provide any answer at all. Does leukoreduction protect against VTE? What about the best antithrombotic? Well, this is the best that we have, and certainly um, within this, 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 this many, many decade-long uh, elegant field of optimizing antithrombotic therapy, um, this stands out as being wholly inadequate. This was a retrospective cohort, uh, pretty much another registry uh, um, uh, from the French. 375 uh, splanctic vein thromboses, 21% of them were in MPNs, and they did not um, uh, uh, really characterize them at all. For malignancy-associated SVT, there were 2.3% annual recurrence with a 1% annual major bleed. The only risk factor for bleeding was esophageal varices. Esophageal varices is a very common long-term complication of hepatic and portal vein thrombosis. Uh, the risk can usually be identified radiographically by characteristics that are associated um, with the, 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 the thrombosis. Anoxaprine or other low molecular weight heparins, there are really no data, although it's often recommended for both induction, in other words, when you identify the treatment, as well as maintenance, maintenance based on a study that is now uh, 13 years old, the CLOT trial, showing that maintenance therapy with low molecular weight heparin for patients with cancer-associated VTE, not splanctic vein thrombosis, uh, reduced the number of recurrences at six months by almost 50 percent, from 17 percent to 9 percent. Fondaparinux, there's no data, despite the fact that it's in that guideline. And then the, the direct oral anticoagulants. As you know, we have three new uh, direct factor 10A inhibitors. Uh, in, in, in order of approval, they are rivaroxaban, apixaban, and edoxaban. And we have one uh, 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 direct thrombin inhibitor that's orally bioavailable, dabigatran. You can find plenty of, of small case series uh, suggesting that these are safe and effective in, in patients with splanchnic vein thrombosis associated with myel myeloproliferative neoplasms, but there are no data uh, of, of any um, uh, systematic or, or quantitative purpose that I'm aware of. What about aspirin for splanchnic vein thrombosis? Well, we talk, when we talk about this, we talk about trying to prevent the first one, and then we talk about trying to prevent recurrence. Primary prevention. Uh, the ECLAP study, uh, the European Consortium for Lotus Aspirin and Polycythemia Vera, um, VT4 out of 253 in the aspirin group versus 10 out of 265 in the placebo group, not significant. And again, these were not splanctic vein thromboses. The MRC-PT1, decre VTE decreased in order of magnitude by Inegrolide plus ASA relative to historical controls and, as I mentioned, in comparison to hydroxyurea plus ASA. So it suggests that hydroxyurea doesn't actually increase the risk, but rather it doesn't do anything to reduce the risk, whereas Inegrolide may. Secondary prevention, there's nothing. Um, in in, in, in uh, idiopathic venous thromboembolism not involving uh, the splanchnic veins, um, there are ambiguous data, which I actually think probably uh, are, 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 should be interpreted as negative. The initial study, the Warfasa study, uh, suggested that patients with idiopathic VTE would, in fact, have a reduced recurrence rate if, after six months of routine anticoagulation, they were put on 100 milligrams of aspirin per day. Um, the subsequent study, both published in the New England Journal, one of them in May, the next one in November, um, uh, demonstrated that there was no effect. And um, uh, in my opinion, uh, aspirin does not provide any benefit for secondary prevention for any venous thromboembolic disorder. What about treatment effects and duration? Well, again, this is the best that we have, and it's really pathetically puny. Um, this is a retrospective cohort. Fifteen patients received anticoagulation for a median of 5.8 years. Um, you can see that uh, uh, about, uh, let, let's see, about two-fifths of them uh, received aspirin as well, and in none of those patients did they actually have any thrombotic events. Did they actually have any thrombotic events? And I don't know, can you guys see that? Okay. I'm not seeing it on my screen, but you can see that, yeah, great. Um, uh, what you'll see here is, is that um, uh, the, the, the conclusive narrative uh, of this paper basically um, describes that there was no association between anticoagulation and bleeding. So in this very, very small group of patients who received warfarin, standard warfarin therapy, it didn't increase the risk of bleeding. 
Okay? And it turned out that, 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 that these, these splanchnic vein thromboses could be lethal, at least in this group. Okay, there actually were three thrombotic deaths. Uh, two of them were not receiving um, uh, any treatment, including one superior uh, mesenteric vein thrombosis death. There were no hemorrhagic deaths. So these are awfully poor data, but they suggest the possibility that, that long-term anticoagulation may be of benefit. Um, they, they do not answer the question whether dual uh, uh, anticoagulant, antiplatelet therapy is of, any, is of any additional benefit or risk, except if you look at this very tiny number of six, the fact that they received no thrombotic, uh, they, they, they had no recurrent thromboses. And then if you look over here at the patients who just received aspirin, there were no thromboses. What about managing Bud Chiari syndrome when it's fulminant? Um, angioplasty with or without stenting. So this requires your interventionalist, transjugular intrahepatic portosystemic shunt, which is you're generally not done emergently but can be done emergently. Okay, and then surgical portosystemic shunt, which is almost always done emergently. Um, a local installation of, 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 of tissue plasminogen activator uh, often isn't particularly useful simply because of the flow. Uh, it's, you're you're in, in infusing something where the flow is in the opposite direction, so it may not get into the clot very uh, extensively. Now let's talk about the known unknowns, Jack. So we talked a little bit about blood. And it's important to realize that, that JAK is expressed in other cells in which it may have significant um, uh, biological effects, uh, so much so that when we talk about its effects on, on the, 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 the round cells, the NK cells of the lymphocyte compartment, then in fact you probably know that there's a, a fairly vigorous hypothesis about using JAK inhibitors to treat both graft-versus-host disease as well as hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis based on animal data. But it turns out that the vessel also has, there is some evidence that JAK is expressed in the, the mutant JAK is expressed in the vascular endothelium. We don't know anything about vascular smooth muscle or subendothelial fibroblasts. And we know very, very little about flow except for this. When we talk about um, a Virchow's triad and the idea that one develops at least portal venous thromboses and mesenteric vein thromboses, um, it's, it's, it's very interesting to note that it's conceivable that extramedullary hematopoiesis is actually affecting the flow through the liver, uh, causing relative stasis. And so this was the first report that I could find of portal vein thrombosis. Uh, it was published in 1961 from the Canadian Medical Association Journal, and what it intends to show in this black and white photo is the presence of extramedullary hematopoiesis sort of interdigitated between the hepatocytes uh, within the liver parenchyma, suggesting the possibility that there could be some squishing down of the sinusoidal blood flow uh, and some stasis. Uh, again, from my perspective, I don't know that anybody has ever really studied hepatic blood flow uh, in syndromes of splanctic vein thrombosis. What about the idea that JAK does something directly, whether it's working through a blood cell, uh, a, the vascular endothelium, whether it's doing something to promote thrombosis? Um, my favorite piece of data is this, which is basically that JAK mutated ET has a risk of thrombosis um, uh, that, that's comparable to polycythemia vera, but the Cal reticulin mutated ET does not, suggesting that the presence of mutant JAK is associated with an increased risk of thrombosis. We also have this about the so-called allele burden, kind of a fashion in this, in this, in, in this uh, subject, and you can see that as the allele burden increases, uh, so does the odds ratio of developing a first thrombosis. Again, suggesting that there may be some kind of a dose effect of the expression of a mutant jack. What about inhibiting it? Well, these are the best data that we have. Okay, these are venous thromboembolic events, which you can see here that in the non ruxolinidem treated patients that that they had these number of events, okay, and in the ruxolinidab treated patients, they had these number of events, okay, and you can look at the, the, the actual values themselves. The risk ratios, I mean, this is a, uh, I guess you'd say this is a forest for the trees plot. You need to figure it out yourself. But um, the bottom line is that there is a, a, a reduction. Uh, it obviously is not statistically significant, and it's ironic that in the response trial, Okay, the one thrombotic event actually was described as a portal venous thrombosis. 
So to summarize in terms of uh, splanchnic vein thrombosis prevention and treatment, uh, phlebotomy probably reduces risk of first and recurrent venous thrombosis in patients with elevated hematocrit. Platelet cytoreduction reduction probably reduces risk of initial venous thrombosis in patients with thrombocytosis. Hydroxyurea remains best pharmacological cytoreducing agent for patients with MPN, but it has little effect on risk of first venous thrombosis. Leukoreduction, JAK inhibition, and aspirin should not be used for primary or secondary prevention of SVT, although each may reduce risk. We don't know. The data to date, at least my view of the data, suggests that possibility. Uh, and then the optimal antithrombotic program for treatment is not known. Until we have data, consider using a personalized approach to anticoagulation. I'm often asked uh, to, 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 to weigh in on the possibility of moving somebody to one of the direct oral anticoagulants, uh, and I often do it, uh, depending on the risk of hemorrhage. When the risk of hemorrhage is obvious and of some concern, um, uh, perhaps the safest direct oral anticoagulant uh, is a pixaban or a dabigatran. Um, uh, uh, and, and therefore, if your eye is on that particular risk, and it usually is in this case, that would, is one of you, the use of one of those two ad agents I would advocate. And then in terms of unknown unknowns, uh, this is a photo of Pierre de Fermat. In 1601, he was born. In 1637, he introduced his last equation. The last equation is that for every integer, positive integer a, b, and c, uh, and every n greater than 2, that a to the n plus b to the n cannot possibly equal c to the n. So this is Fermat's equation. We've heard of this. This is Andrew Wiles. He was born in 1953. In 1963, when he was walking home from school, he started thinking about this. He became a very famous math mathematician, won the Fields Medal. In 1986, he actually started working on it, and in 1996, he solved the equation. Okay, and I do think that that, that splanctic vein thrombosis is something that we're all interested in. We may scratch our head when we see these patients, and we're not quite sure what to do. We may follow clinical guidelines, hoping that, in fact, we're doing the right thing. Nonetheless, there aren't very much data. These are rare events and rare diseases, and I'm afraid that it's going to take the computational bio biologists, many of whom were mathematicians, to help us sort out Okay, those factors uh, that really can help us understand mechanisms uh, that will lead to, to new views of, of treatment. We're not going to have big clinical trials with 18,000 patients like AFib uh, in managing these patients. So thank you very much for your attention.